speaker, a friend of the East Chapel Hill Rotary Club, uh, J.B. Buxton. He's been with us before when he was serving in the capacity as um, on the uh, state school board. Um, Y'all probably remember his bio from, I think it was a year and a half, two years ago, um, but he was a Moorhead Scholar here in Chapel Hill, so um, longtime friend of the university, um, a teacher in his background, consulting on education in his background, and now, um, or, or relatively recently, taking on the role of uh, president of Durham Tech. And so here to speak to us today and tell us what's new at Durham Tech, what's new in the world of education. Um, I can't wait to hear uh, any comments that might be germane to remote learning and that sort of thing and, and anything else that he wants to speak about. But if you all please join me in giving a warm uh, East Chapel Hill Rotary welcome to J.B. Buxton. Welcome. Welcome. Nick, thank you. I appreciate it very much. And uh, you all gave me a good reason to put on a tie. I haven't done that for a while, but I thought if I was going to come see you, I'd have a tie on. So I might just do that and make sure I could remember how to tie it. And also, I'm actually coming to you from the Hillsborough campus, Orange County campus for Durham Tech. I was doing a little bit of visiting with our EMS classes today. Uh, if I were out there, I would have my mask on, but since I'm shut up in the room, otherwise, as Liz knows, when you're, when you're at Durham Tech, whether you're on the grounds or you're in a, a building, you are masked up. And, uh, but it's, so it's really good to be over in our, our Orange County Hillsborough campus. I'm going to show you some slides here in a second. I want to just talk a little bit about Durham Tech, kind of where we are, where we're trying to go amidst all the challenges of the past year. I do want to just note just a moment of personal privilege since David was going through that history lesson and on this day uh, that I saw a little bit earlier this morning that Hammer and Hank Aaron had passed away. Yeah. And I don't know how many former baseball players we have out there, but that's a big blow. And the very first baseball game I went to in 1976 with my dad at Fenway Park, I grew up in New Hampshire, Hank Aaron was in the lineup because he was over with the Braves at that point. And, uh, well, the Brewers, excuse me. And so I've got, the, I've got the scorecard. Thank goodness my dad was keeping the scorecard. So I've got the scorecard of, of Hank Aaron in the lineup. I think he went about five innings, which at that point in his career was probably plenty. But anyway... I uh, just, it's, uh, it's a significant chapter in our country's history. And uh, was, he, he lived a good life, but still tough to see him go. All right, I'm gonna try to share my screen. And let's see, I think I need to get permission to share my screen if someone could, Nick, is that something you can do? And if not, I can just, I can just talk. But it might be more interesting for you to see a couple pictures I'd love to show you. And, and while we do that, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about and a little bit of a, a reminder of, of some of what Durham Tech does in the community, a little bit about what we've been focused on over the past six months. I came in July of uh, July 20th of last year, so about at the six month mark, uh, and a little bit about where we're trying to move going forward and what is specifically on our mind as we think about the role we need to play as, as your community college in this region and as an institution that's trying to connect people to opportunity and support our employers. There we go. Okay, so let me, let me pull this up and let me know if that is showing. Yes. 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 Okay. So I'm going to move through. I got a Handful of slides here I want to move through, and at any point that you want to stop me, please do that also. I'll make sure to leave time for us to have some conversation. Uh, just a quick reminder, we, we've got about uh, five locations in the region. We've got the one in Hillsboro, where I'm coming from today. We've got our main campus kind of just south of downtown, and then a number of different offices around uh, Durham County, where we do classroom space, where we do about 100 different uh, programs, degrees, diplomas. Uh, in, a, in an average year, we have about 19,000 people coming through Durham Tech in some way, shape, or form. That might be one course uh, in, a, in a continuing education area. It might be someone, a nurse coming back to continue his or her training. It might be a high school student. It might be someone coming straight out of high school. But about 19,000 people, and, and generally that's about 5,400 full-time 
students. We are a little bit down this year. The pandemic has, has made an impact on community colleges across the country. And in North Carolina, it's no different. Most community colleges are about 5% down uh, and especially down in populations, African-American, uh, Latino males are, are populations that are not availing themselves of community college courses at the same rate. And that is pretty much the same story just about no matter where you go. And it certainly is with us. And I'll, I'll be happy to talk a little bit about that moving forward. We offer a lot of different programs. What I want you to see here is one thing that Durham Tech does different differently than a lot of community colleges is we concentrate in what we call meta majors or kind of guided pathways through. And rather than just offer you a huge course catalog and kind of choose your adventure, we try to get students to get clear about the kind of sector they're interested in going into, information technology, healthcare, health and wellness, engineering, building and skilled trades. And then you come in within those meta majors and whether you're taking courses trying to lead to an associate's degree or you might be just taking a couple courses that are part of a, an avocation or a set of skills you want to pick up, you're within the same program. So if you decide at any point you want to move and you might come in to take a couple certification courses uh, in the healthcare and decide you actually want to get an associate's degree in nursing, we make it much smoother for you to have that pathway. In the community college world, time to degree and make sure we're not wasting people's time by getting them into courses and then starting them back at zero if they want to switch is a really important issue. People come to be connected to opportunity and to move quickly to the op those opportunities. And Durham Tech, before I got there, was working hard to create really clear pathways through the institution that allowed students to make some shifts and not lose time. And I think that's an important part of Durham Tech's story. Uh, one thing I want to make sure you know, because it's in your backyard, uh, and this is where I'm coming to you from, is the county commissioners in Orange County voted recently to, to move forward in the next three years on an expansion of our campus here. So we'll go from the building that you see to a second building. We are at capacity in this building here. We do a lot of work with high school students. We do a lot of work with EMS, public safety, skilled trades, logistics. We just can't do a lot more right now because of capacity constraints. And as we come back post vaccine to more in person than we are now. We're about 85% online right now. As we come back more in person, having access to lab spaces, places where people can do work on uh, healthcare simulations, it's critical. And same with skilled trades and logistics. And so we are extremely excited about the opportunity to put more programming in Orange County and more services and class opportunities programs for Orange County residents. We've got too many Orange County residents that have to come over to Durham to do that coursework. And we're glad to get a little bit closer to home. When we started the fall semester, we put five priorities in place. And I'm not gonna talk through all these. I just wanna tell you about a couple of them, but just to give you a sense of where we were focused. One of them obviously was reopening with safety and accessibility and equity in mind. And, and the reason we're talking about those three is because we didn't, we didn't go 100% online. We did for the spring, but when we came back in the fall, we were about 80% online with the goal of being able to do courses for, let's say, nursing or uh, dental lab technology or surgical technology or HVAC, where you've just got to be in person because the skills you've got to develop working hands-on or practicing on mannequins in the case of nursing. And so we were able to put about 25 20% of our classes in hybrid, so some online, some in person, or fully in person. We reduced the class size, reduced the density. You're masked up the whole time. About 80% of our courses online just due to the, the realities of the pandemic. Uh, I'm happy to say that because we had very aggressive protocols about masking and distancing and check-in procedures, uh, since March of 2020, we're still sitting on 15 confirm positive cases on campus and no community spread. Now, I'm knocking very loudly on wood as I say that, but we have had a good track record of staying safe. And when we've had issues with a positive case on campus, quickly moving into restricted access and quarantining and taking the, the steps we need to keep people safe. So we've had a, a pretty good run of that so that we didn't let 
a pandemic crisis become an educational crisis for a lot of our students. Uh, on these other items, I'll just say one thing about that green one down at the bottom. Because we went online in so many more classes, we were about 30% online in the, in the fall of 2019, about 80% in the fall of 20, and about the same now. We had a lot of work to do to make sure that online environment was a, a positive one for students. I would say that's very much still a work in progress. I'd love to tell you that we made a seamless switch uh, and it's been, it's been great for everyone. It hasn't, it's been hard for a lot of our instructors. It's been hard for a lot of our students, especially for students for whom that connectivity to an instructor or to peers and study groups is really critical to their path and their journey in education. And so while I think we've had pretty good success and we haven't seen our success rates in terms of grades and completions dip too dramatically, I would recognize that this has been a hard shift for many of our students and many of our students who are coming back into education after some time out and to come back just fully online has not been easy, but we're getting better. And this spring, we're putting some practices in place that I think get us even better. I wanna say a couple words about the back to work efforts. And I wanna start by showing you not real time because it's not January, it's mid October data. So relatively recent about what the changes in employment have looked like in our backyard. This is Orange County. And this compares where we were in mid-October to where we were in January of 2020. So about a 10 month frame. And what you can see is, this, this to me is maybe the best picture that explains this kind of K-shaped recovery, K like kangaroo, K-shaped recovery that we're seeing where we're actually seeing a pretty significant uptick in employment rates among our high wage workers, a little bit down middle wage workers, uh, it's about 7%, 7.0% down overall, but close to 20% down for our low wage workers. So a kind of tale of, of really two or three economies and two or three experiences in the pandemic. Because we all live and work and cross boundaries and I live in Durham, work in Durham, but many people are living in Durham, working in Orange, living in Orange, working in Durham. You can see it even more significant issue in your neighboring county. When we look at what's happening in Durham, we see middle wage employment rates down close to 20%, but we see low wage worker employment rates down almost 50% since January, 2020. So for us, one of the things we thought in the short term we had to focus our attention on was how we got workers who were, or individuals who were unemployed or underemployed back into the workforce and oftentimes pivoting into a new sector. So if you're working in retail, you're working in a hospitality, culinary, and you just saw the earth fall out beneath you, how we created some opportunities for you to take some courses that move you back into the workforce. And so we created what we called our back to work initiative, where we, we took some existing courses, but then built some new ones and put them into six to eight week courses. And think about a set of skills that you can gain in six to eight weeks to give you the opportunity to move into basically entry level positions. So you've got to pivot out of one sector, move into another. And so we picked kind of high demand sectors. And I'm just giving you a few examples here in areas like information technology, healthcare, uh, construction, advanced manufacturing, where we could offer that course six to eight weeks for anywhere from about 190 to 300 hours, an average about $250 and a very, I think, highly affordable rate for education to workforce opportunity. That said, we also knew that we had significant uh, wage impacts on these very individuals and folks who were having to make some real decisions about where to put their dollars with housing costs, food costs, even costs related to children being online that might be in their households. And so we were able to find a little bit of private money and thanks to the governor and his use of federal money, we were able to deploy scholarships. So for most individuals who find themselves unemployed or significantly underemployed as a result of COVID, we could find scholarship money to defray the cost. And in some cases, we can go beyond the cost of the courses, and we can also provide some support for transportation, childcare, and other areas within a, a certain dollar amount. So this has been a major focus for us to kind of move into the, the maelstrom of what COVID has created. 
Another thing that we've really tried to, to step up our leadership on is our leadership in equity and inclusion. And I, I think anyone who works in a community college likes to think that they are part of the vanguard of this effort. And there's truth in that. At the same time, we've got some institutional practices with hiring. We've got some institutional practices with how our leadership uh, and our faculty look like or don't, our student body. We've got some issues with how we deploy resources. We've certainly got some challenges with what our results look like in course completion, degree completion, labor market outcomes, when you disaggregate our data and look at how our black students or Latino students, male students are doing as they move through our institution. And so we really, not only, I wouldn't say recommitted, we committed ourselves to a series of actions in a plan we released publicly to cover all those areas and then hold ourselves accountable. And then, uh, and Liz McFarlane, who's on the call with us has been a part of this, we launched an equity and inclusion fund out of our foundation. We've been raising resources uh, for that fund in order to support the faculty and staff development on issues of race and racial equity. And this year we we're putting about 170 of our full-time staff through some racial equity training. We're putting a campus-wide commitment and set of measurable objectives to hold ourselves accountable to. We're doing a lot of work as a campus to engage as a student, employee, and sometimes trustee community to have some courageous conversations about how the institution is holding up its end on this equity front. But we just realized that this was a time we needed to be very clear about our intentions and what we wanted to hold ourselves accountable to. Part of the reason that is so critical for us is what you see on this map. And many of you are familiar with this conversation about economic mobility and the degree to which children who are born in the bottom quintile or bottom two quintiles of the economic distribution, unfortunately across the South, but in North Carolina and especially in our urban centers, Raleigh, Raleigh-Durham, Greensboro, Charlotte, have some of the lowest level of economic mobility in the country. We, for unfortunately, sit really at ground zero for this issue. Put in a very simple way, poor children remain poor in our communities. And we, despite the great educational institutions, the great labor markets that we have here, we don't have a lot of upward mobility within families where children are born into greater levels of poverty. And when we think about the role that we can play to make an impact on that, we see that as an area that we are really called upon to very clearly address. What gives us great hope in that is that when you think about what the labor market and the opportunities for upward mobility are in this region, we are in a better position than about anyone in the country. So if I were to toggle back here for a second, while we may be in one of the toughest positions in the country in what our history of mobility looks like, we are in one of the best positions in the country in terms of what our labor market looks like. You don't have to read all the, the <laughs> words on this slide. I will just tell you that if you look at the top of this chart, which was done in the midst of the pandemic, so not before, in the midst, looking at industry sectors in this region, life sciences, IT, manufacturing, think advanced manufacturing, vaccine development is an example, healthcare, construction and skilled trades, all of these sectors plan to grow the workforce moving forward. And when you look at a picture of what those specific companies look like in our region, what comes alive to you is just how rich we are in job possibility in economic mobility. And so our ability to work in concert with three strong K-12 school systems in Durham, Orange, and Chapel Hill, Carborough, great four-year institutions, NC Central, Duke, UNC Chapel Hill, NC State, a and if you go a little bit further, our ability to move students through pathways to degrees, credentials, and jobs in these kind of companies that you see here is an enormous opportunity. Those pathways aren't as open and strong as they need to be. That's one of our commitments as we move forward. I've often heard, especially in the life sciences, and I'm gonna pick on a company here because it was where I heard it from, where 
someone at Biogen when they heard a, a recent exam announcement of, I think it was Bioagilytics or another one of our life sciences company said, uh oh, well, we, we better protect our employees because we're, <coughs> we're going to get poached. We don't want anyone to need to poach employees. We want them to have a pipeline coming to and through us in partnership with other folks where they can resource their companies with great talent. And so one of the things we are doing, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, on, on two more slides here, and then uh, my experience with this group is you got a lot of great questions, so I'm going to stop and get to that. Uh, we have tried to realize that, well, I think we've got a pretty good history at Durham Tech of being focused on the right things. We also have data which should make us uncomfortable about just how strong our outcomes have been. And so we made a commitment to bring in some external organizations who are the premier organizations in the country in either the community college or higher education space. And one of the strongest in the Southeast in the Belk Center over at NC State focused on community college leadership to come in and do an external assessment of where we match up against uh, the pillars of something called the Aspen Prize. So the Aspen Institute runs an Aspen Prize for community college excellence, which looks at how you do as an institution on completion, equity, teaching and learning, and labor market outcomes. We wanted to benchmark ourselves against the best colleges in the country on that Aspen Prize and see where our gaps were. So these three have come together. I'm thankful to the JM Belk Endowment for providing the resources to bring them together and support the work. They're going to deliver a report to us in March about kind of hold the mirror up to us and where we stand. And then we're going to use this to build our go forward strategic plan about how we're focusing to build economic mobility, completion and real equity and outcomes for all students who are coming to us. Last thing I want to say here, and some of you, if not many of you, will know some of this. And it's something that I think this region ought to have great pride in. These are some pictures from Durham Tech's past. And they're pictures that I like to put up because I think they predict our future. If you look at that top left and what's an old building that looks a little different on our campus today, it's got a, a more ornate facade now, but it still stands. That was the building that was put up in the late 50s and in early 60s, 1961, when we opened to start the Durham Industrial Education Center, when that community back in a time when community colleges didn't exist, decided to put up half a million dollars in some land and create a new kind of educational opportunity. And we were one of the first six communities in the state to answer that call. Durham Tech was the first community college in the state to hire an African-American president first community college in the country to create an associate's program in clinical trials. And when you think about clinical research trials and the enormous market that is in our community right now, we were the first one to do that in the country, creating associates and a pipeline into that industry. Back in the 80s, we were one of the first to offer telecourses with PBS. That seems very prescient now as we're all coming together uh, over video, but we were working with PBS to look at UNC TV, to look at how we could provide some distance learning. And then you see a couple other pictures that focus on microelectronics and one of the first programs in micro, microelectronics in the state as IBM was really beginning to dominate the park and how we situated our offerings to support areas of growth in our economy. So we feel very confident that the work of, kind of rethinking what we offer and how we are doing in ensuring our students, all our students are moving through our institution, uh, getting degrees on time, but not just getting degrees, but getting degrees in program areas and sectors that lead to family sustaining wages and lead to economic mobility, kind of economic ladders where they go in, they've got the chance to grow and the chance to support a family. That's critical. We can't just graduate people with course degrees. We need to graduate people in areas that then give them a real shot at mobility. So that's why we brought in some outside folks. That's why we're focused in, in the way we are. And that's why we feel good about what the, the future phase for Durham Tech is going to look like. So with that, let me, let me stop the share, come back out to the bigger group here. And uh, Nick, be happy to answer any questions.
JB, thank you for sharing your time with us. That's a, a really an excellent insight into what's going on locally. I want to open the floor to, to questions, and our club, you're right, is usually good about having some good questions. Folks, uh, you know the protocol. I'll, if you, you think of something, I'll call on you right now. I'll open the floor and you can ask, but if, uh, if some, while somebody is asking one, if you think of something else, uh, feel free to please chat chat your chat me that you have a question and I'll I'll help moderate that. So uh, I don't see anybody in the queue yet. Who any anybody have a question? Uh, Greg, I do. Go ahead, Greg. JB, um, we have one member. I think he's on the screen on the screen today that asked several questions. I'm only going to ask one, but it might be a little lengthy. You mentioned this upward mobility issue. And you show uh, that the, the rural areas are, are, I guess you'd say, from your perspective, or somebody's more upwardly mobile for people that you know maybe start out behind. Uh, I have earlier before you joined us, somebody talked about getting a shot in Siler City. You use that as an example. It's hard for me to imagine or juxtapose your contention with rural America being upwardly mobile. You know, there's little opportunity education, little opportunity uh, economically, job growth, and all that sort of stuff. Could you maybe enlighten us on that? And uh, somebody you probably know, Jim Johnson at the business school, always sings the praises of rural North Carolina. And it just doesn't square with me. I, that it doesn't make sense. Can you help help us with that. Yeah, absolutely. And so let me let me be clear about what I'm saying which is when you look at data that is literally for every metropolitan statistical area in the country. So this is Raj Chetty's data from the Harvard uh, Quality of Opportunity Project. What you find is that we have some of the lowest rates of mobility of children born in the bottom quintile moving up a couple quintiles, especially the top quintile, but even moving up a couple. So despite some pretty strong, and, and this is not rural versus urban. This is just reflecting the reality of what it is for the Raleigh Metropolitan Statistical Area, which we're a part of, but also Charlotte, Greensboro, and most of the South. Our urban areas aren't providing more upward mobility than our rural areas when you look again at people's movement from bottom to uh, the upper, upper quintiles. And so it's not a, a contention that you'd be better off growing up rural it's just a contention. You're not necessarily better off growing up in our urban areas in North Carolina if you're born poor. Alan Young has a question. Alan, are you on the call? Yeah, he's there. He's just getting himself unmuted, I think. Can you hear me now? Yes. There we go. Sorry about that. JB, thank you for coming. Absolutely. We've been lucky to have you, and I think it seems like Durham Tech's very lucky to have you. What have you to say? What, uh, I'm wondering, I, I have multiple questions, but I'll just, I'll just give you one. What has surprised you most uh, in the six months you've been there? I think, let me, let me cheat and give you a couple things. One, one's on the kind of positive surprise and one's on the uh, negative surprise. What has surprised me most, I think, was just how durable the challenges have been dating back to March with uh, Black, Latino, and males in our enrollment push. Basically, the way I'd say it is the impact of COVID disproportionately on certain populations, the impact of the economic shifts disproportionately on certain populations have been reflected in our enrollment. And we made a real concerted push to uh, try to attract folks who were, we were seeing loss of enrollment and it's just not made a lot of difference. I think the reality is we're gonna have to get more in person before we see significant changes and people are gonna to have to see more certainty in the schooling environment for their children, if they have them, or in their own job situation. And so just a pervasive sense of uncertainty and lack of clarity has made a lot of folks, especially amongst those demographic populations, put off higher education. And I, and I think that's 
unfortunate because I think this is a time when we've got to make sure we're investing in individuals from that standpoint. On the positive side, something I knew about Durham Tech in particular and community colleges in general was the strength of the faculty. I did not know the depth of the strength of the faculty we have at Durham Tech uh, before getting on the on campus and getting a chance to meet people, mostly like this, to be honest, not in person, but like this. We have an outstanding talent at the college. And it is really gratifying to think about the ex the instructors that our students have access to, no matter what kind of courses they're taking. I just you know, I've been in education a long time and known community college system. I don't think people know the, the extent of the talent you get at our institutions, which makes it all the more important that we end this three year drought and finally at the state level put some put some more money into our community college faculty and staff. They've gone three years without a raise. Thank you, JB. Laurie Palacilli has a question. Laurie. Hi, JB. Thank you so much for your talk today. I run the Orange County Visitor Bureau. And at first, congratulations on your expansion. I saw that uh, approval at the end of the budget season and with Commissioner Dorison really pushing for that. So congratulations on the budget approval there. Um, at the Visitor Bureau, we study what trends there are in visitation. And it seems like advanced manufacturing, clean tech, life sciences, and AI are the future. Is that something that I, is that part of your skilled trades program as we move forward? Yeah, it, advanced manufacturing, absolutely. We do some logistics we're working on and working on developing those, those program options. AI is a, is a matter of conversation within some of our program areas and including healthcare. And I'm trying to understand and unpack what AI is gonna mean in the healthcare sector moving forward. I mean, for a lot of this, you know, one of the challenges sometimes we have is you put a degree program together, it's made up of a series of courses and those courses have learning objectives and you build that out. IT is one of these areas. Two years later, you finish that degree and the world has changed into what your employers want. And so one of the things we're going through now is an evaluation. When I showed you that picture with those four quadrants, really trying to understand uh, what those sectors are looking for and how our programs are built vis-a-vis -vis those sectors. We, uh, I won't bore you with the details, but we recently entered into an agreement with the Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber, the Durham Chamber, the Orange County Office of Economic Development and the Durham County Office of Economic Development, where we've gone in together to purchase a labor analytics tool that we can all be using to look at not just what's projected to grow over the next 10 years and what jobs are available, but what are the specific skill sets that employees are asking for? And we get that refresh daily. So we, can, we are really looking together at where uh, the counties are trying to move in terms of attraction within the sectors, how our programs are built against them so that we're a little more demand driven and not just trying to add to those hundred programs and think about what else we can put out, but really get focused on where the counties are moving. And then what are the skill sets within? I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. That's hard. I'm really trying to think about, okay, where's AI moving and how do we build that into our programs? But that's, that's kind of the challenge we see sitting in front of us right now as this economy is shifting. In addition to thinking about what are historic program offerings that we got to really reconsider in the wake of COVID-19 and how the economy may be shifting and what virtual environments are going to do and what people's appetite for hospitality and culinary is going to be. We got to really think hard. We, we don't have uh, a printing press for money. Uh, thankfully, we got good county commission in both Durham and Orange County that support us but we're gonna to have to be real smart with where we deploy our dollars in terms of alignment with those kind of sectors. Thank you. Liz Hinky has a question. Uh, JB, great presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the new Washington administration will be pushing clean energy um, and hence renewable energy jobs. What changes do you anticipate will be needed um, to educate our citizens to meet the needs of these new 
new jobs that are coming down the pike? Well, I would say if I think close to home first, it's an area where we get a chance to evaluate where we have program offerings that are going to feed into that industry. And uh, it's, it's not just in terms of skill sets in certain degrees. It's also where some of our efforts in building and skilled <coughs> trades and engineering, pre-engineering work that we do, we have an associates in engineering, where they can position against uh, the growth in the sector like you're talking about. We also, I think, feel like we've got a moment post-COVID where we've got to really rethink how, how deeply involved we are with the K-12 system. And by that, I mean, we need to be more deeply involved because I think we can create some pathways to, to opportunities that don't lock any student into uh, an occupational future, but create some opportunity to move into our courses earlier in their career, finish degrees earlier in their career, and then move out. Do we have a, let me say this, we have a lot of challenges at times with students who come to us without the math skills they really need to succeed in a degree program. And often we are then working to build those math skills and we take a lot of time, which is one of the, the precious elements that a lot of students, especially if they're out working as well, just don't have. We can front load a lot more of that in our partnership with Chapel Hill, Carborough, Orange, and Durham Public Schools. We think we can more, more clearly integrate our offerings where you can get to that two-year degree or a credential much faster. You can cut the cost of higher education and you can still move on and articulate to an NC Central or a Chapel Hill or a Duke or wherever you might wanna go. The, the area you're talking about to me is ripe for that. We can create a pathway where you can begin early. Any skills you build to move into a clean energy sector, a clean tech sector, are gonna be good in all kinds of economic pathways. And so we think we can just begin that process a little early. We, are, we do some work for sure, and we have course, courses that students can take in high school now. We're, we're trying to think about a deeper level of engagement that might kind of rethink post-COVID, especially for students who have lost a lot of time while they've been at home. Brian Keeliff has a question. JB, you came and spoke beautifully last time. You're clearly one of the visionaries that we've got. I mean, each time we hear you speak, uh, we, we just are so impressed by your grasp. So you get a phone call from Washington, Joe Biden. You get a call from Roy Cooper. They say, come and help us. We want some, uh, some advice. How are we going to solve these issues that are facing America uh, now in, in the areas that you specialize? You know, I think of Germany with its trade schools and so forth. What, do you, what advice are you going to give? Well, first off, I, I appreciate that, but I could also give you uh, a bunch of my peers around this state who are doing a lot of the work that, that we're talking about right here. And so we are, I, I will tell you, we got some really strong higher education leaders in North Carolina, both in the four-year and the two-year system. So I'd probably recruit them to get on the call with me because I would need some help. But one of the things I feel strongly about is related to what we just discussed. And that is we need to create tighter relationships earlier between our high schools and our community colleges and then up to our four-year partners, and then into our, into our job sectors. If we want to think about apprenticeships and work-based learning opportunities for young people, we have a lot of young people that by grade eight decide what they're not going to be. And what they're not going to be is anything related to life sciences or IT, because they either don't see people who look like them in those, in those sectors, or they just don't know enough about what it takes to get there or how pretty interesting and exciting the jobs can be. That includes teaching, where we can move people earlier. So I want to get, I want to front load the system a little bit, not create so much sluggish, such a sluggish path through. And then I want to articulate from a, a sector standpoint with our four years into some guaranteed jobs. I think in our community, life science is a great example of that. Healthcare is a great example of that. But the other place where we need help and where we really are challenged in, in playing our role is not just what I talked about earlier, making sure we can recruit and retain the best faculty by paying them well. We're uh, 40th in the country in North Carolina 
in average community college faculty salaries, 40th. And we're 10 out of 16 in the Southern states. I mean, we're not average in our own backyard in terms of how we pay our folks. The other one is equipment and the ability to get our students working on uh, current equipment. So whether it's healthcare, life sciences, dialysis, you know, you name it, we've got to have our students working on the kinds of equipment that they're going to move into the job force with, or else they're not particularly marketable. We do a really good job, good job at Durham Tech and in general, North Carolina on transfer. You come get an associate's degree, we can move you into the university system, you'll be pretty successful. And we have a great ability for you to enter in as a guaranteed junior. We got to do better at our pathways to moving people to economic mobility in the applied sector, where folks are going to try to move from us into, into, the, into a job. And, and we can do better in preparing folks so they have opportunity for mobility. So That's Jamie, a long answer, and I apologize. But, but, but so, JB, the universities get a certain amount of money. How much does the commu do community colleges get in North Carolina? We, we do about half on a per student basis. So we, we would get roughly half of, on the student basis of what the universities get. Now, the universities are housing students, and uh, their, their costs that they have. We don't need the same funding quite in that way, but there are areas in equipment, there are areas in faculty talent, staff, and, and frankly, the other area that I, I wouldn't necessarily talk with, with Biden and Cooper about because it's money that we can deal with. We gotta do a better job of case managing our students through our institutions, not just helping them with pick courses, but making sure we're, we're getting them across the finish line and how we case manage some of the challenges they face in their own lives. Good luck on all of that, JB. That's a good vision. Thank you. <laughs> well, JB, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. We want to be respectful of, of your time, and we're grateful for you uh, for being with us today. Um, folks, let's extend a nice warm round of applause to JB for sharing his time. We're grateful for what you do in our community and beyond, and we thank you for being with us today. Wish everybody a safe and, and uh, healthy weekend. Look forward to seeing you again next week.